I'm here with Godard Abel, the CEO and founder of G2.com. Prior to G2.com, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, uh, you uh, were part of Big Machines, which is acquired by Oracle for $400 million in 2013. And then you were also, uh, you did Steelbrick, which was acquired by Salesforce for $360 million. I believe that was a all-stock deal, is that right? Yes, we were lucky to get Salesforce shares. Yeah, you got some of that CRM stock. That's great. In 2016, um, tell me about your experience building those first two companies. Well, they, it was very different journeys. I mean, the first company, Big Machines, was actually a 13-year, I would say, struggle until we got to a successful exit, whereas Steelbrick, we were able to apply everything we learned at Big Machines in the first 13 years, and we really had just as much success in terms of getting to an exit, having impact on the world in less than two years. And uh, so that was really exciting for me and our entrepreneurial family because we brought over 100 people that had been part of Oracle Big Machines into Steelbrick and then Salesforce, and just to be able to use everything we learned and you know do it better, faster a second time. It was a uh, you know, that was a wonderful experience. You're also the executive chairman of Three Kit. Tell people what Three Kit is. Yeah, Three Kit is really a next generation of what we built before CPQ, but it's all about visual configuration and visualization of products in 3D and AR, or what now people are calling the metaverse. And what 3Kit does, it really helps brands sell their products in the metaverse by creating amazing 3D digital twins, 3D visualizations of those products. And it really helps in this age of e-commerce. And especially with COVID, a lot of us are doing virtual shopping. You know, it's not safe to go into the store, but you could do a virtual try on, let's say the shirt I'm wearing, you know, or you could see the couch in your room. We're working with Crate and Barrel, for example, to create amazing product visualizations of their couches. And if you want to see your couch in the room in AR and VR and see what it's going to look like before they actually ship it to you with very realistic fabric, color, details, shading, so you can actually really visualize how it's going to look in your room. That's the amazing technology that you know 3Kit is providing. That's amazing. You've, you've had an incredible, you also worked at McKinsey early on in your career, which is obviously a blue chip firm. Um, you're known for G2.com though, which is a software and review platform. It's the world's leading software and review platform. I don't think anybody buys software without first uh, going to G2.com to uh, figure out, you know, what people are saying about it and kind of all the reviews and everything like that. Uh, what what had you come up with that idea and make you think that that would, that would uh, turn into a business like it has? I mean, it's, it's unbelievably successful. You've raised over $100 million for it. Yeah, no, thank you, Clint. And it was inspired by our experience as entrepreneurs building big machines and steel brick. And so we were always software entrepreneurs, software sellers. And we saw firsthand, frankly, how hard it was for our customers to discover apps like ours. And especially my first company, Big Machines, it was our first time. We didn't raise a ton of money. And frankly, most people hadn't heard of us. And I remember one of our first big customers at Big Machines became Rolls-Royce. Not the cars, but they make truly big machines. They make big steam turbines, big power generation units. And they finally discovered Big Machines became our customer. And then they said to me, wow, Godard, I wish we discovered you two years ago. We've been trying to build this configuration software in-house, and we didn't know vendors like you existed. And so we saw this massive problem that oftentimes businesses didn't know what software would best help them solve their business problems. And on the other side, as entrepreneurs, we also saw the challenge of breaking through all the noise because on G2 today, there's over 100,000 apps. So it makes it really hard for the buyer to find the right app to solve their business problem. And it makes it really hard for the seller to break through the noise and discover their ideal customer right when they're shopping. And that's really what we set out to solve with G2.com. We wanted to quote unquote consumerize shopping for business software because we just thought it was way too hard for buyers to discover apps and buyers also to trust the vendor, frankly. And as well as a vendor, the pitch, but we realized most software buyers don't trust sales and marketing because you know, obviously we're trying to sell our wares and frankly, tech has gotten so good at it. Our, Marketing is so shiny. Our demos are so beautiful. But then I think everyone has fears in the business setting. Hey, is this app really going to work? And that was the other thing we really wanted to build in the G2 is to find peers, trusted peer reviews. So you can really Clint, you know, find someone like you and ask them, learn from them. Hey, does this app really work as advertised? 
And if so, then, you know, you can make a quick buying decision. At what point did you realize that G2 was going to be successful? Um, well, and I think the hope and belief was always there. You know, it's probably true as an entrepreneur. Like you're like, you believe in the vision somehow. You oh yeah, work. for sure. So in that sense, that was always there. But then frankly, also like most entrepreneurs two years in, we're like, wow, this is much harder than we thought. And, you know, we didn't have any revenue yet. And what was really hard about building a review platform was actually getting the reviews. And we also learned, and we read blogs from Yelp, and Yelp was really a pioneer in consumer reviews for restaurants, bars. I think we've all used Yelp. And I remember their founder wrote a blog that was interesting. And really what he said is 99% of people never write a review. And I hate to admit this, but before I started G2, I never wrote reviews either. You know, I'd free ride. And most of us do this. You know, I always <laughs> read reviews of how I was shopping on Yelp or on Amazon. It was great. Helped me pick better restaurants, better products. But I didn't want to take the time to write them because I'm busy and and that's true for most humans. And so I think that took us a long time to figure out, hey, how do we get enough reviews on software products? And we started in the CRM category, which we knew, but how do we get enough reviews so that we get meaningful insight that when software buyers come, there's enough reviews, enough content that it can actually help them make a better buying decision. And that took quite a while to get that going. Having gone through selling two companies prior to G2, what advice would you have? And it seems like there's tons of M&A happening right now. I'm sure you've noticed this. Uh, what advice would you have for entrepreneurs who are looking to sell their company right now, mm. having gone through that process twice? Well, one, I would say don't start out looking to sell your company. Right. Um, because I think in both cases for us, it wasn't us trying to sell the company, right? but we had a great partnership. First company actually with Salesforce and with Oracle. And, but Oracle, we had a lot of joint customers with their Siebel CRM on demand product. And then when Oracle wanted to get stronger in the cloud, you know, they really, they actually came to us at big machines and said, Hey, we'd love to turn big machines into Oracle CPQ cloud, which it is today. And frankly, same thing with Salesforce. First, we were a partner. And I think our mindset was always, and we knew CRM integration was really important because, you know, we were making quoting sales, quoting software and every sales rep in the industries we're serving was already using a CRM system to update their sales pipelines, to manage their customer contacts and accounts. And so we knew to offer our customers a good experience with our quoting app, it had to tie into the CRM. And, uh, and so then we you know, did a lot of technical work to make Steelbrick very seamless. We call it a native integration to Salesforce, but make it so the sales rep didn't even notice they were leaving Salesforce to use Steelbrick. And so we started with the customer in mind and said, hey, to give the sales rep the best quoting experience, it has to be totally seamless with Salesforce. So we also said, hey, to enable that, we really want to be a close partner. And, and then eventually that led to you know, a strong partnership where Salesforce also invested twice. And you know, they got to know us better and better. And you know, we already had hundreds of happy joint customers. And then at some point, Salesforce and you know, Mark Benioff said, hey, we'd love to bring this to all our customers. And I think that's true of most great acquisitions in tech. And also John Samordry, who's the EVP of corporate development, runs Salesforce Ventures, runs MA. What John Samordry always says is, you know, great companies are bought, not sold. And so I think that's a really important mindset for an entrepreneur is build a great solution. I do encourage partnering, and especially in B2B software, if you have a great, a great solution with a bigger partner, at some point it may naturally lead to the outcome, you know, where they want to buy your company. What's it like working with and doing a deal with uh, Mark Benya? Um, well, for me, it was amazing. I felt lucky. Um, and I think he is, he's an entrepreneur I very much admire. And, you know, he's also written books that I would recommend, like Beyond the Cloud. And, you know, kind of he's very openly shared how he's built Salesforce. And also he's come up with a unique business model, you know, including his 111, his philanthropy. And so I was always fascinated by Mark as a partner. And, you know, and I think ultimately our acquisition, kind of the impetus for it occurred, I had a chance to meet Mark and, you know, share our steel brick demo, share our vision, how we could really help Salesforce customers with their quoting, with their billing and make them much more effective. And, you know, and frankly, after that meeting, he just loved the demo so much. I think he's also intuitive where he saw, wow, you know, if we could bring this to thousands or hundreds of thousands of Salesforce customers, that would be amazing for our customers and obviously help his business. And, uh, and so I could tell he just got energized and I'm not sure he had the idea before the meeting. I'll never know, but 
but I just, you know, saw his energy. And then he was obviously very convincing where, you know, that being part of his company for our team and for our customers would be a natural path. And, uh, you know, so we were ultimately excited to join Salesforce. You've also been on the other side, uh, acquiring companies. What advice do you have for CEOs who are looking to buy companies right now? Because that's another, I mean, obviously this M&A stuff is, is a big deal right now. Yeah. And I'd say, you know, a lot of times it emerges very similar way on the buy side. To give you an example, one of the companies we acquired at, uh, at G2 is called Advocately. And they were actually a partner to G2. They discovered, and Patrick, their founder, CEO, was a sales rep or a sales leader at a company that was actually using G2 reviews. And he also realized, wow, it's way too hard to generate reviews to get his customers to validate his product. And so he decided to build Advocately, really all to help, and it's called Advocately to Unleash Your Customer Advocates, to help them write reviews. And he actually focused on G2 because he saw we were becoming the most influential platform. And he had about 70 companies that were using Advocately to generate more reviews on G2. I got to know him at a couple of Sasser conferences and loved his vision. And then it was kind of like what Mark Benioff said, oh, if I could... And with Advocately, I'm like, wow, if I could bring this, now we have 2,700. If I could you know, take this from 70 to 2,700 G2 customers by having you join our team, that would be amazing for our customers. It'd be good for our business. And the other thing is always the chemistry. I do think that's important in tech, you know, the cultures fit. And I do think it starts with the CEOs or the entrepreneurs also having a common vision, common values. And I definitely felt that with Patrick. You also have to kind of just feel the vibe. Like, do you both get more excited, more energized when you talk about the prospect of bringing the products and the companies together? And that was clearly the case with Patrick. And then, you know, I got excited, built a business case, took it to our board. And, you know, they agreed they would you know, accelerate our business. So I do think partnering, getting to know each other and building relationships and having the trust. Because I also think in tech, it's very much Salesforce philosophy, our philosophy. You know, if you buy a company and everyone just quits day one, there's really no point in doing the deal because all these tech products right. are works in progress. And so I think you only want the deal to happen if you're confident the cultures are aligned, you're gonna enjoy working together, you're gonna have a bigger impact on the world together. And I think that only happens through building relationships and you know, in partnerships. And sometimes you hear stories, and I've never used an investment banker either. You know, It's always just natural relationships. Obviously some people sell their company that way, but I, to me, the best deals happen through natural partnering, relationship building. And then at some point, it's just the right time for both companies to come together. How do you think about fundraising? You've obviously raised a lot of money for all these various ventures. What advice do you have for entrepreneurs or founders or CEOs going through that right now or seeking that or the best way to finance your company? I know you're close to Ryan Westwood at Simplus, um, who I think is – a real innovator in the way that he went about funding his company using all sorts of different strategies, both VC, um, debt, all, all the, you know, the variety of ways that he did that. How do you think about fundraising now? And you're right. I think Ryan Westwood, great fundraiser at Simplest, and obviously he scaled that company super successfully. Now it's part of Infosys, as you know. Um, and I think one of the things he did that I would recommend, I mean, he raised money through relationships and, uh, and I was, you know, we were his partner at Steelbrick. He went in on Steelbrick CPQ even before we were bought by Salesforce because he, and it's similar, he and I met as entrepreneurs, we had equal values, excitement, right? We both, both walked away really energized. And Ryan said, hey, I'll go in on Steelbrick. And we said, awesome, because we were uh, still a nascent startup. In fact, the big, at the time, Infosys, Accenture, the big partners wouldn't have wanted to work with us anyway. Uh, but then I also wound up investing because you all asked me like, you know, but I wound up personally investing because I really liked Ryan. I believed in him. Obviously, I saw the value to our customers, our partners. And I think he did the same with many Silicon Slopes entrepreneurs. And I think Ryan is based in Utah, you know, where you are, Clint. And so I think getting to know entrepreneurs in your local community. And I think he had also had, you know, Josh James, founder, CEO of Domo, another very famous entrepreneur in Best. So he started out with building relationships in the entrepreneurial community. And then entrepreneurs had success having them invest. And, and I do think investing, especially early stage, is such a trust business that I think if there isn't a personal connection and you don't have a relationship to build on, I think it's really hard. Obviously, some companies just have the perfect metrics. Like, I've never honestly had a company like that. I've heard stories about, like, Mark Zuckerberg. He turned on Facebook. All of Harvard was using it overnight, right? So some businesses, 
but I think they're like one in a billion have just perfect metrics. And if you have perfect metrics, Tiger will call you, right? And fundraising is easy, but I think most of us don't as right. entrepreneurs. And then I do think building relationships first and building personal trust is the key because early stage, usually there aren't many metrics. So, you know, the person writing the check has to trust you and believe in you, believe in your vision and believe that you're going to turn their money, you know, into a great business. You know, what's interesting about Ryan, as, as you were talking about that, it reminded me of a story. Uh, I've known Ryan forever. Um, we, we both grew up in Utah, both grew up on farms, both grew up kind of in the same area. Actually, we both managed a franchise of a deli just one town apart, which is really funny. So I've known uh, Ryan for a long time. And early on, when it wasn't called Simplest, I can't remember what he was calling it prior to Simplest. Um, he was called, but he, like, there was reach. this, there was this organization. Yeah. yeah, 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 something like that. Yeah. There was this organization here in Utah County, uh, which is where we're from, the county inside of Utah that that, that we live in, and uh, it was called Utah Venture Entrepreneurial Forum. It'd been around for about thirty years, but it kind of been like uh, when when Ryan and I started uh, getting associated with this organization, it kind of been languishing. It was, it was, you know, a lot of service providers and things like that inside the organization. And so what we did, it was really funny. We, uh, we took over the organization. Ryan was the chair of it. Uh, I don't know what I was inside of that thing, but I was, I was something. And then, uh, everyone else, he created a board where everyone else on the board was a venture capitalist and it was every venture fund in the state of Utah, who was on the board of this thing. And I think we even rebranded it to the Utah Venture um, Entrepreneur Forum or something like that to make that clear. And he built all those relationships. And I believe a number of the people who were on that board invested in Simplest and are still investors to this day in that company. And then when he left, it's just like, all right, we I, I think we folded into the Silicon Slope or something. But the way he did that was so beautiful in building relationships, like you were saying. Yeah, no, and I think you're right. And I think, Clint, frankly, what you're doing today, I know you're a you know, CEO of Silicon Slope. I think you're making it a lot easier for entrepreneurs. Or in Chicago, where we started G2, there's an incubator now called 1871. And I think most entrepreneurial communities now have some kind of hub. And But I think Silicon Slope, I think you make it a lot easier, right? Because the VCs, they come to your events. And I had a chance to speak at your Silicon Slope Summit, you know, but you bring together all the entrepreneurs, the VCs, the partners, and that obviously makes it a lot easier. But I think you know, at those events, if you're the entrepreneur, yeah, you really have to also put in the energy and the effort to go and meet them. And at the beginning, really all you have is your energy and your passion. But I think, you know, then having the courage and the conviction to build those relationships, and it is hard the first time. I think as a first time entrepreneur, it's really hard to raise money. I think now, you know, Ryan, I think it's some day he'll probably build another venture, you know, my second and third, and now I'm involved in two more, but you know, obviously every success you have, it's easier to raise money. And, uh, but I think that first time it's really hard, right? Because you have no track record and there are more people also trying and yes, there's more funding dollars, but I think if you look at it, there aren't actually more deals being done. So it's like the companies that can raise money can raise more and raise it really fast, but it's still a struggle. I think for most entrepreneurs to, you know, raise money for their first company. I'm sure you're thinking about this uh, and and following it quite a bit. What are your thoughts on Web three? That seems like like what's happening in Miami, what's happening in New York City, what's happening even like Wyoming, and obviously here in the state of Utah. And I'm not sure about Chicago, but I'm sure that everyone's talking about this. Uh, how are you thinking about that? That feels like this whole new wave. Yeah. No. And uh, Clint, I think uh, I think Web three is tremendously exciting. And I was also lucky. I did hear about the blockchain Bitcoin a few years ago, you know, and luckily bought some Bitcoin. Uh, and I've always loved the concept of adding more trust to the internet by having a really you know, trusted ledger that can really connect parties, facilitate transactions. And I recently heard Mark Andreessen speak about it, but I think what he says is it's adding the layer of trust that's always been missing in the internet and the cloud by really authenticating people and enabling transactions, enabling trust. So I do think it has tremendous potential. Do you think Silicon Valley will ever be Silicon Valley again? Well, I think it'll probably never have the same percentage of global entrepreneurship. And I think I used to look at it 
you know, global tech, kind of half of it was in the Silicon Valley. And I spent time there actually after Steelbrick, uh, Steelbrick and Salesforce, actually I moved out to Palo Alto when we were acquired because you know, mm -hmm. I was working out of the headquarters of Salesforce. And I think the Silicon Valley traditionally always had about 50% of global tech was in the Valley, which is just incredible. And then 50% was everywhere else in the world, Utah, Chicago, India, you know, wherever. And I think, I don't think that'll ever happen again. I think the Silicon Valley will continue. There's so much money there. I think it'll keep growing, but I think now entrepreneurship, I think is growing faster everywhere else, you know, including Utah, Silicon Slopes, that's booming, Chicago, but G2, we're also a very global platform. So we acquired Siftry, a startup in Bengaluru in India. And so I also went right before the pandemic, they had an event called SaaS Boomi. And uh, now, you know, the example is Freshworks. That was a company started in Chennai, India. They did a massive IPO this year. Another company, a lot of success on G2 UiPath. They went public, $40 billion market cap, and they are starting in Romania. And so I think the reality is, mm. and it's really cool. Now you can build a startup anywhere, especially SaaS in the cloud. And so I do think that trend is going to continue where I think great entrepreneurs, great companies will be built more and more anywhere in the world, you know, not just in the Silicon Valley. What's the best leadership advice you've ever received? Um, hmm. Well, one is core career advice before I was even really a leader, but I remember I was working at McKinsey and you mentioned it earlier. I was a very well-known management consulting firm. And frankly, my first couple of years, I was fresh out of school at MIT. And so I prided myself, probably like most MIT students, but I was pretty good at math, good at analytics, you know, but I kind of prided myself, hey, I'm just kind of the spreadsheet guy, you know, and I'll, I'll do the analysis, I'll run the spreadsheet, I'll drop mm -hmm. the slide. But then when the meeting's happening with the client or the senior partner, I'm just going to stay quiet. And if somebody asks me a question, you know, I'll do that. And then it was really interesting. I remember John Perlisi was one of my first senior engagement managers, one of my projects. And, you know, he just said to me, he's like, hey, you got to speak up. And I was like, what do you mean? I thought I was doing a good job. He's like, hey, when we're in the meeting with a senior partner and you know something from the data that, you know, the partner's not seeing, you got to speak up. You have to share your insights, share your knowledge. And that was just a really empowering moment for me where, and then I started trying it and I'm like, oh, wow, people will actually also listen to me and value my opinion, right? Not just my spreadsheet skills. And I just remember that being a breakthrough moment that I think also a lot of young people, and then I think also as an entrepreneur, it's very important. That's talking about relationship building. I remember one of the things I did early on my big machines days and Mark Benioff at Salesforce, they were a partner. I remember he was speaking, it was right before their IPO. He was speaking at a big conference in Chicago. And in fact, just having the courage, I just walked up to him and talked to him and told him my idea. And so I think having that courage to speak up share your convictions, share your insights. That to me was a, you know, kind of a big breakthrough moment to shift from just kind of being a, a nerdy engineer and smart analyst to you know, really having a bigger impact in, in business. Do you read a lot of business books? What's, what's your favorite in, in that category? Yes, I do. I do love business books. I love reading about entrepreneurs and even, you know, I like reading about Carnegie. I read his biography, Rockefeller. And some people would say, well, that was 150, 200 years ago. It's not relevant today, but I actually think the basic leadership principles, people, innovation, that's never changing. And obviously tech is a whole new medium. So I love reading some of the classics, if you will. And then I think more contemporary, one that really inspired me recently is No Rules Rules. And uh, that's from Reed Hastings, the founder of Netflix. And, you know, together, he talks a lot about how together with Patty McCord, their chief people officer, how they built a really unique no rules, rules, no rules culture at Netflix and really focused on talent, talent density, and just an extraordinary company. And I just hired a chief people officer, Preeti Patel, and we're both drawing inspiration for that. We're like, hey, how can we build such a unique culture that someday we can write a book about it? And uh, so that's that's one of the recent ones. And I am also a big fan of Mark Benioff and certainly Behind the Cloud. And, and he wrote another book. But I'd, anyone in SaaS and cloud, I would certainly recommend his books. Oh, I totally agree. Well, uh, I want to be respectful for your time. Last question. Uh, what does the future of uh, G2 look like? Well, G2, we want to realize our vision. We want to be the place you go for software. So what we want, Clint, is every time, and you're a knowledge worker, you're a CEO, business leader, but every time you need software to make your work better, we just want you to think of G2.com. 
and we want to be the most trusted, influential site and marketplace for software. And I think today that's true in some categories, but I hope in three to five years, that will be true for a billion knowledge workers around the world. And as we achieve that, we do hope this time to ring the bell and build a meaningful public company. So that's my unfulfilled dream as an entrepreneur. Oh, you're going to do it with this one. I, I think G2 is an incredible company. It's amazing what you've built, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, it really means a lot. And I'll read your book when you publish it. Thank you. And thank you, Clint. And I hope to come back to Silicon Slopes next year and uh, see you and the great Silicon Slopes community again in person. Let's do it. Thanks, my friend. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you.